In the last segment, we looked at acid-base titrations, and we saw that water looks like water, looks like water, looks like aqueous water. So you need a indicator to tell you when to stop. Usually and typically it's phenylphthalein in beginning labs, but there are other ones that you can use. We did a couple of problems. We should have done some problems in the last unit, so I would invite you to go back to those notes or go back to your book and make sure you can do an acid-base titration calculation. Okay, so go to your book, go to your notes, go to any videos that are out there on this. Okay, other reactions, most of these are also just review. So single replacement, zinc plus HCl. Remember with single replacement, you look at an activity series and make sure that zinc is more active than HCl, which in this instance, it is. Zinc will pair with chloride, zinc forms a plus two, Chloride forms a minus one, so you know that you need two of those and that your product is ZnCl2. The H plus is displaced, and remember H plus is um, a diatomic element, so it'll form H2. To balance, you need a two here. Okay? Now, if you've done the lab already, you will see that if you write a net ionic equation for this, that zinc plus 2H plus yields Zn plus 2 plus H2, and you will see that this is also redox. If you haven't done the lab yet, then this will manifest itself in the next unit or in part of what, what we're doing moving forward. Okay, so remember with your single replacement that you need to look at your activity series, predict a valid ionic product, at, at least in terms of whether the reaction will go forward. Decomposition, we talked about this, but you may have forgotten some of it. Carbonates or bicarbonates, H2CO3, will decompose to form water and something else and that something else is CO2. So usually and typically carbonic acid is not soluble in water. And in fact, more often than not, you get H2CO3, double arrow, remember it's weak, H plus, and bicarbonate. And we'll talk about the relationship between carbonic acid and bicarbonate in just a minute. Nonetheless, there was a second one that we had on our list, which is H2SO3. will decompose into water and something else, and that something else is SO2. And the evidence of reaction is that CO2 and SO2 are gas, so if you do this, you will see bubbles. So these are kind of special, uh, special reactions, and you should kind of commit them to memory because they do this when you see them. Okay, so this brings us to acid-base buffers, and this is new for anybody who came from Chem 110 because we do not talk about buffers or even weak acids, really, in Chem 110. A buffer is a solution consisting of one, a weak acid, and two, the conjugate base, which resists pH change. So you need a weak acid, and we talked about how you determine a weak acid. You need a conjugate base, we talked about how you determine that. And the value of it, why are they useful, is that they resist pH change. Okay, now many, many things are very, very, very susceptible 
to pH change, particularly proteins and enzymes. Okay? Now, how do you identify a buffer system when you see it? Okay, so the two criteria, HCl and NaCl, remember that the sodium is a spectator. So while you could say that the chloride is the conjugate base of HCl, HCl is strong. So this is not a buffer. H2CO3 and sodium carbonate. 2Na plus CO3 2 minus. CO3 2 minus is not the conjugate base of carbonic acid you would need H2CO3 and HCO3 minus or HCO3 minus and the carbonate. So bicarbonate is the conjugate base of carbonic acid or carbonate is the conjugate base of bicarbonate. Either way, that's not a buffer. Acetic acid and potassium acetate. Well, remember, CH3CO2- minus is your acetate. Your potassium is a spectator. So if you have acetic acid and potassium acetate, it's providing the acetate. So yes, this is a buffer because the potassium is a spectator. HNO3 and NO3 minus. This is saying we don't care where the nitrate comes from. It might come from sodium nitrate or potassium nitrate or iron 3 nitrate or calcium nitrate, any kind of nitrate. But this is not a buffer because this is strong. H3PO4 only. Well, that's a weak acid and that's great and well and good and all, but you have no conjugate base. So, no you would need H2PO4 minus. This is what you get when you pull a proton off of that. Okay, page 19. How do you calculate then the pH of a buffer? Well, remember, if you have a strong acid, usually you can just plug in. You know this. You push log, you push negative, and you get pH. If you have something that's weak, you have the Ka equals x squared over the amount of acid that you started with. You solve for x, and then pH equals the negative log of X because you've defined that as H plus. If you have a buffer, you have something new that you need to do. And this is called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. The Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is pH equals pKa plus the log of the conjugate base over the acid, where pKa is equal to the negative log of the Ka. So the question is, well, what is the Ka and where do you find them? Well, you find them in a table somewhere. Or you have to be given the Ka in the problem. So the first thing you do is you ask yourself, is it strong, is it weak, or is it a buffer? So the question here is, what is the pH of a solution containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5.0 times 10 to the minus 5th molar acetic acid and... 1, 2, 3, 4, 1 times 10 to the minus 4th molar acetate. Well, acetic acid and acetate means that this is a buffer. Pull a proton off and we get acetate. Acetate is the conjugate base of acetic acid, so it's a buffer. And what that means is that we have to use the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So let's take it in parts. The pKa equals negative log 1.8 times 10 to the minus fifth, which is equal to 4.7. Log of the conjugate base over the acid. 
So the conjugate base is 0 0.12310 molar, or you could use scientific notation if you wish. 0 0.12350 molar, and then you're going to be taking the log of this. Okay, so 0 0.00010 000 divided by 0 0005.2. We take the log of that minus 0.7. We're going to go to the tenth place. Minus 0.7. So what this means is that we start at 4.7 and when we add all this extra let's see it looks like 1, 2, 3, point 2. Okay so we add all this extra excuse me all this extra acid. If you add five parts of acid for one part of base for something that is not buffered, your pH would go way, way down. But because this is buffered, it's only, quote unquote, only going to go down by 0.7. So our pH, when we swamp our system with five parts of acid to one part of base, will still not be that different in the grand scheme of things of 4.0. Okay, what is the pH of a solution containing blah blah dihydrogen phosphate and blah blah hydrogen phosphate? Well, ask yourself strong, weak, or buffer. While dihydrogen phosphate is a weak acid and hydrogen phosphate is a weak acid, but when we put the two together, dihydrogen phosphate hydrogen phosphate, this is the conjugate base of this, so this is a buffer. So pKa equals negative log of the Ka, which is 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8. Seven point two. So biologically or physiologically speaking, if blood pH is 7.4, this is a pretty good starting place. Log of 0 0.00025 over 0 0.001234. 1, 2, okay, that looks like the log of 25. Twenty-five. Take the log of that. That's going to go up 1.4. So what that means is that the pH will start out at 7.2. We put in tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of base. 25 parts of base for every one part of acid. And it raises it by 1.4. And our pH is 8.6. Again, if you have a non-buffered solution, you're probably off the chart. You're probably surpassing 14 on your pH scale. But because it is buffered, it keeps the pH reasonably not too bad to within 1.4 pH units. Okay? And then last on this list, we'll begin on the next segment.